Thanks for joining us today. If you'd like to support this resource and others like it, you can do so by visiting our website, thechapel.cc give, and select the giving option that works best for you. Enjoy the message.
for just, I don't know, three hours? Would that be all right? Would that be good? The weather is fantastic, is it not? So good. Such a great day. Yesterday was great. Saturday night service is getting, when weather like that, when it's that beautiful, it's extremely hard for me to come to church. Because I look outside, and this morning, the sunrise was so great before morning prayer. It was awesome. And I just thought, Lord, I don't want to go to church. It's so nice. I'm just kidding. Hey, listen, can we welcome everyone watching online right now and the Hernando Correctional Facility? Come on, church. Great to have you guys with us. I just want to say if you're staying home for health reasons, we get it. But if you're staying home because it's a habit, stop it, okay? We miss you, right? And there's nothing like being in the room, amen? Listen, I want to start a series this week. I usually say, like, um, I think it'll last maybe two weeks, three weeks. Sometimes I don't know because I get more and more thoughts as I start to write it and kind of communicate it with you guys. And I want to think through, because uh, th- I'm watching something happen in culture, and I know you are too. You, what, what's happening is um, Christianity is changing, like the definition of Christianity. It's changing. Like Monday, it means this, and then Friday, it means something else, and then Saturday, it means something else, and then on Sunday, it means something else. It's kind of similar to what we said on Monday, but, and I want to talk about what are some of the things Uh, attributes, symbols, distinguishing factors that categorize a Christian. And I want to start with foundational things because we get what a Christian, a believer and a follower of Christ, and we always say believer and follower here at the chapel because the enemy, our spiritual enemy, believes in God. So it's believing and following, it's just not believing. It's believing and following. What are those distinguishing? What does the brand of Christianity look like when you and I go to work, we hang out in the community when we're with our friends? What does the brand of Christianity look like? And of course, the Bible is incredibly clear about this. But the first idea is to understand the brand and what a brand means. And we see certain brands, don't we, like this. When we see that, we kind of go, oh yeah, I, can. I get a picture when I see that logo or brand or symbol, I get a picture of the product. Same thing with this, right? Champion, right? Just so we're clear, Champion was big when I was 15 years old, right? It's big again, which is great, and I know it's hard to believe because I'm only 24 years old. I know, it's weird. But when we see a brand, it, it kind of creates pictures for us. And, and then we see brands like this, like Like, that's a little higher end of a brand, right? Are you with me this morning? I'm very insecure. Help me out. Are you ready? We see a brand like this. Some of us might think, oh, rich, expensive, bougie. We might just think, oh, people. Sometimes we wear a certain brand because we want to communicate a certain thing. Sometimes we wear certain brands, symbols, because we wanted to say something about us. See, growing up, uh, oh, there wasn't uh, uh, D&G. There was, I had to, when I shopped, I had to shop in that section right there, the Husky section. You know, we, we bypassed like the Levi's and it's like my mom would be like, no, honey, no, sweetheart. We shop in the Huskies. We have Huskies and still to this day, I'm bringing back Husky, baby. That's what I'm saying because that was cool back in the day. You had to be really a secure person. Maybe that's why I'm still in counseling. You had to be a real secure person to actually walk in school wearing those. Just, uh uh-huh, huskies, that's right. What are you gonna do? That's why I got into a lot of fights in high school and college, right? Right, the idea is sometimes we wear a brand, but the brand says something else. It has a deeper meaning. We see logos all the time. We know this, right? Baskin and Robbins, we're familiar with that logo that brand, that symbol, but it always sometimes have a deeper meaning, right? Because, right, 31 flavors, we see that in the logo. It's, got a, it's telling you Baskin and Robbins, ice cream, but in the logo, it says a little something else, 31 flavors. If, you're not, if you didn't know that, I want you to frequent Baskin and Robbins so you can become husky, okay? <laughs> right, I mean, in logos, Hershey Kisses. If you're a Christian, you have a bag of these in your house. 
because they bring joy. They bring smiles, right? But sometimes with symbols, there's always, there's sometimes even a deeper meaning, right? Because look at the kiss between the K and the I is a Hershey kiss, right? There's always sometimes in the logo, in the brand, there's always a deeper, in the symbol, there's always a deeper meaning. Not all the time, but most times. A symbol is just not the surface. There's a meaning below it. And we know this, Wendy's. Some of us don't really like Wendy's a whole lot. I don't necessarily go there. I go there for one thing, and that's the Frosty. Because I'm a pastor. All good clergy go to Wendy's for a Frosty. That's what I'm just saying. But we do know that when Wendy's first came out, they wanted to differentiate themselves from every... They wanted to differentiate themselves from everyone else. So they made sure that the logo said something that we could all relate to, mom. They wanted us to understand that this was something that your mom would approve of. There's always a hidden meaning behind most iconic symbols. And what we know about something that a Christian should have is they should be practicing symbols that really identify them as Christians. They should have symbols. The Bible's clear that if you love one another, Jesus says, well, then you're my disciple. There are certain attributes, behaviors, language, that classify us, qualify us, categorize us as believers and followers, but there are also symbols that we relate to those who believe and follow. And much like the symbols we're used to today, there's also deeper meanings. One symbol is water baptism. And it has been changed and manipulated and misconstrued from its very simple nature of what it meant. A symbol for those who believe and follow, but like most symbols, there's something else below. And I want us to get one thought. Jesus is water baptized by John the Baptist in in the Bible. He's right about 30 years old. Jesus has done nothing in his ministry in his life. The only evidence of, that we have of Jesus growing up is what we would know through history on what Jewish boys would go through and how they would learn and how they would interact. There is only one scripture in all of the Bible that describes Jesus before the age of 30. One scripture. And what you find when Jesus begins his public recognition or his public ministry is he begins the whole thing by being water baptized, this symbol. The Bible says that Jesus comes from a distant land and he sees John the Baptist and John the Baptist sees him. And John the Baptist says, look, here it is, the Lamb of God. John the Baptist is a predecessor of Jesus. He's a prophet. He's very well known, a lot of followers. Jesus says, I come to be baptized. John was baptizing believers. Jesus says, I want to be baptized. John is absolutely blown away. He says, you want me to baptize you? I should be being baptized by you, Jesus. Jesus turns around and says, no, to fulfill what the Old Testament said about who I am, I need to be baptized by you. Jesus has done nothing up until this point publicly. His first public act is water baptism. What Jesus is doing, history tells us, is reenacting with John the Baptist an ancient, religious, beautiful ritual for the Jewish people called the mikvah. And during the mikvah is the young Jewish men 
and later in history they tell us women, would go into a body of water that de-escalated down so it would get deeper as you walked in. And as the water covered the feet, the leaders of the church, then rabbis would pray, Lord, watch over his feet where he goes, may you be with them. And then as the water covered their legs and their internal organs, because the soul deep down inside for the Jewish mind was the seat of all emotions, would say, Lord, let goodness come forth from this fountain as the water would cover the stomach. Watch, they would say and pray. Watch what this sun accumulates. See, symbols have deeper meanings sometimes. They have other messages. As the water would get deeper, and Jesus would go into the water, and they would pray as the water covered the heart, keep his heart free of strife and make it be full of your peace. As the water would cover the hands and then being fully immersed, because that's what baptism is biblically, fully immersed. The water would cover the eyes and the mouth and the mind. Keep his mind stayed on you. Keep his eyes seeking you. Protect what he hears. May he be trained. The Jewish prayer used to be, let him be trained to listen and just not hear. Jesus is reenacting this symbol of water baptism. Because it's a symbol that you and I would carry as believers and followers of Christ. It's a symbol for you and I. I remember being baptized only because I saw pictures. I was maybe a year. Wasn't wrong, just wasn't biblical. It was beautiful and there was tons of food because my grandfather was there. If my grandfather's there, there was always food. Jesus is giving us an example of a symbol because symbols represent things. And there are certain symbols that represent certain things. A message. But much like symbols, when Jesus comes up out of the water by being baptized by John the Baptist, the Bible says that a voice from heaven, because symbols have other deeper meanings. Here we go. Lean in. Lean in. A voice from heaven came saying, and a voice from heaven says, this is my son. Simple phrase we would think on the surface, but it says, this is my son. What God the Father is doing is giving us an example of how he saw Jesus, and I would submit to you and argue with you that the entire ministry of Jesus is saying the same thing even unto death and resurrection. This is my son. What God the Father says is, listen, you're mine. You belong to me. Other people might want to claim you. Other people may want to say things about you. But never forget, you are mine first. Huh. And then it says, a voice from heaven said, this is my son, whom I love. Whom I love. And I think it's important to understand that the key word here, whom, it's not love. It's I. I. See, because it's important to know the context. Jesus has done no miracles. Jesus has done no teachings and words of wisdom. Jesus hasn't healed any sick, brought someone to life, made the blind see, made the deaf hear. He has done nothing related to his assignment. Let me say it again. He has done nothing behavioral. He has done nothing related to who he is, the son of God, the miracle maker. He has done nothing. But yet God the Father says, this is my son because you have a place to belong. You're mine. 
Then he says, whom I love, because the love of God is not based on what you do. It's based on who you are and you are his. See, all of a sudden, this symbol of water baptism, although beautiful, has another meaning. See, all of a sudden, this symbol has something else. This is my son whom I love. It's not connected to anything, performance, because we, ha- see, we have the benefit of the end of the story. We know the story. See, Jesus, because some people will try to tell you who you are, but remember, you're my son first. You see, other people may try and show you and tell you that they love you. As a matter of fact, there probably is going to be a guy that you allow really close, but before some bird crows three times, he's going to deny you. Right. Before you start anything, know these truths. You're mine. It's possessive. It's a place you belong because you're mine. Start with these truths before you do anything. That you're loved because I created you in my image, not because you make big paychecks or have more followers on Insta. Okay. And then he says, whom I am well pleased. Whom I am well pleased. Now when we see that word pleased, for me, I would go, well, he's happy with what he did. He's happy with with what he's doing. The word please there is the same word that shows up in only one other place in the Bible. In the original language, it only shows up one other place, and it's in Genesis. When God stands back, and looks at his creation. This is good. He looks at Jesus and he says, that brings me happiness. That brings me goodness. That brings me joy. He hasn't done anything. It's because the love of God is not performance-based. It's identity-based pleased silly example but this is it's what I do guys okay just go with me I cleaned out my garage the other day I I took everything listen I took everything out I cleaned you could eat off the floor in my garage right now and when I was done I just stood back. I can fit two cars in the garage now. Can I get an amen right there, right? Yeah, I was like, yeah, yeah, I know. I thought that'd mean something to you, yeah. I just looked back and went, that's awesome. That's good. That's what God does. You were made in my image. You're valuable because you're mine. I'm not pleased with you because you get it right. I'm not displeased with you because you get it wrong. I'm already in love with you. Because symbols have a tendency to have, see, it's just not water. Although beautiful, it's a symbol that has a little bit deeper of a meaning. Here's the idea. You belong. You're my son. Uh, your identity, your mind, you matter. I'm well pleased with you. Here's the question. How many times have we compromised who God created us to be because we want to belong to a certain tribe or group? How many times Have we compromised who God has created us to be when I become something 
wear something, buy something, so that it would tell people my identity. How many times in our lives do we struggle with figuring out where to fit in or what kind of parent or father or mother or businessman or woman so that we can fit in a group, fit in a tribe, be categorized as something? How many times have we compromised who God created us to be because I want to do something significant, but I don't feel value until others believe I'm valuable. See, because before Jesus did anything that anyone could see, God the Father says, make sure you have these three right. Before Jesus does anything that we know of about him, miracles, the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, raising people from the dead, turning water into wine, a couple of loaves, some fish, feeding thousands. Remember that you're mine because you're going to have a day, Jesus when you think that you're all alone. Remember that you have a place to belong because even the ones that say they love you and would go to the ends of the earth may just abandon you. Understand that you matter because I created you, not because of your accomplishments. And I would say every single time that we value more those three things, belonging, identity, and matter. You and I having to matter, making a difference, we say here. Anytime those three things are horizontally based, we compromise who God created us to be. Anytime that I do something, here's, here's how it plays out. I want people to love me. There's nothing wrong with that. I want people to like me. I want my kids to love me. I want to be respected, nothing wrong with that. But what happens, or who do I become when I don't get it vertically? When I don't get it horizontally, who do I become? Who do I become when my wife, who says she loves me, doesn't treat me the way I believe she should treat me? Who do I become? Jesus, before you do anything, make sure you know where these three things come from. Make sure you know where these three things come from. Why? Because when we search on earth for spiritually designed fulfillment, we will diminish our lives. Nothing wrong with wanting to be loved and respected, revered, provide for a family, Nothing wrong with being, wanting to be, to accomplish. But what do we become when we don't attain it? Is our identity based on a brand? Is our identity based on a paycheck? Is it really who God created us to be so that we would belong or do we just do it because that's what every mom and dad does who are in their 30s or that's what everybody does who's 17 or is that what everybody does when they're 55, 65, or 70? Anytime that we get more fulfillment horizontally that we should be getting fulfillment First, I would argue that Jesus even says, by the way, seek first 
the kingdom of God and everything else will be added. See, over and over in his life, his re- he is reiterating what God the Father told him. You belong. You matter. You have my attention. I'm gonna pray for you. There are people already who had registered during the week to be water baptized. This is your time to go and meet some of our red shirt team that are gonna guide you to be baptized. But I wanna pray for us because God is saying something to everybody in the worship center this morning and online as well. Right, you belong. You're mine. You matter because you're mine. I love you because of who you are, not because of what you've done or what you earn or what you accomplished. I see you. Worship team is gonna play a little bit. I just wanna encourage you, often symbols have deeper meanings and a symbol of a Christian who's a believer and follower is water baptism. But below the symbol, there's always another meaning. Something that's to be conveyed. Amen? Thank you, Lord, so much for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your word because it's your voice and we hear it today. Continue to speak, continue to move. Lord, thank you for the truth that we have a place to belong because of you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. My story isn't over, my story's just begun. And failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. No failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does.
Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You guys can be seated. You know, when I look at the scriptures, and it talks later on in the scriptures, uh, Paul planting churches, he, he, he teaches these young churches what water baptism is. And he actually never goes into the actual history of the symbol. He goes to another layer of meaning of the symbol because it's a brand that Christians wear, being water baptized. And he tells the churches, and he goes over and over in different churches, and he explains what water baptism is like. And he says this, we were therefore buried with him through baptism. So it's just not water, it's just not this water. It's... We were buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have, may live a new life. What Paul says to the churches is you have to understand it's just not this thing we do. Oh yeah, it's just, it's a, symbol, it's a symbol, it's an emblem, it's a moniker, it's a brand, yes. But there's this other layer of meaning. And he says, let me tell you what it's like. It's like when you go into the water, you are living one way. But like a death and resurrection like Jesus... When you come up out of the water, you die going into the water of one life, and you come up out of the water another life. Just like Jesus died a life here, but then rose again, conquering all, the Son of God, the Messiah and Savior of the world. It's just another. Paul, all of a sudden, is like, oh, it's like a death. But if you read the Bible like I do, I go, new life. Well, what was the old life? Well, if it's a new life, how do I know it's new? How do I recognize it's new? Because really, if I come up out of the water, I don't necessarily have this immediate change. Like all of a sudden, I don't get angry anymore. But Paul begins to teach the church is that the old life was a life that was lived in every decision that had to be made about what we post, what we read, where we go, what we do, what we say about our bodies, about our sexuality, about whatever decisions we have to make about our families, about our spouses, about our money, about whatever decision that we have to make whatever category of decision making. The old life based everything on what I feel, what I know, what I think, what I feel good about, what I was taught, what my culture says, what my upbringing says. The new life brought to life by Jesus Christ is a life that says, yes, those things, I hear them, but what does Jesus say about all my decisions? See, the new life is not a sinless life. It's a saved life. It's like this wedding ring. This wedding ring doesn't make me married. My behavior and my posture makes me married. This is just a symbol to let people know I am. See, what Paul is trying to tell the early church is this new life. You can't have this new life. Over and over, Paul emphasizes one point about the new life. There are several, but you have to have humility. Why? Why? Sometimes we think humility is when our favorite player hits the ball over the fence in baseball and everybody's telling him how great he is and he goes, thank you, I just, I just want to thank my mom. 
We see the fastest runner in football catching a great pass in the end zone, sets a record, and when they interview him, he says, let me just tell you, it's a team effort. It was the whole team. That is a partial definition of humility. But humility, in the truest sense of the word, for the believer and follower is when everything in me wants to say something that I know God did not create me to say and I go, no, I'm not going to say it. Lord, what do you want me to do with my mouth right now in these words? And I opt for what Jesus says. I humble myself and I elevate the Savior. Every single time I want to do something, I humble myself and elevate how Jesus created me to live. That is the new life. And in those moments where I fail, and in those moments where I'm not representing the brand well, I get to lean into, I get to take advantage of, I get to grasp, I get to hold, I get to receive his forgiveness, his mercy, his strength, and his power. Not in a way like, ah, yeah, I did it wrong. I'll just ask for forgiveness. No. But in a way that it's a privilege to be marked as his son who belongs who has his God's attention. Paul says it's this new life. See, because when we say we are done living every decision based on us, when we say we're done just living, not being perfect, not being sinless, but when we say we're done and we've identified that he is our savior, our God, we're done living just for what we think, what we feel, what others tell us, what others are doing. When we're done with that, oh, well, then Jesus says, well, it's not over. Well, it's not over. I got a new life for you. I have a new life. And this life will be a journey of you and I coming together in every decision that you ever make. This will be a journey of you inviting me into every situation. This will be a journey of you leaning into who I created you to be. This will be a journey of you looking first vertically instead of horizontally. This will be a journey day after day, week after week, where we slowly, sometimes a little bit more than others, are transformed into who I created you to be until the very day where you stand in front of me and I say, come on in here. Good job, faithful servant. That's the new life. And if you don't understand it, you're not living it. If you live it, you know it. But some of us don't understand Christianity like that. The meaning behind the symbol of water baptism. It's very simple. I want to pray for you. Because the times that we live in are not for the weak. The times that we live in are not for the mediocre or lukewarm. The times that we live in are causing us to choose. And I want to make sure that today, with everyone watching online, you have a choice to live the way God intended you to live with certain symbols that represent who we are. If you don't know Jesus in the everyday, in the daily invite, in the daily strength of him, and in the daily forgiveness by him. I want to pray for you. 
I just want to pray for you. At the chapel, we call it a simple prayer of commitment. With everyone watching at home, our online hosts will have directions for you. But if that's you, I want you to pray. Just say this prayer, no embarrassment, no weirdness, no emotionalism, no. Church family, say it with us because I don't want anybody to feel singled out or embarrassed. If that's you, pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, forgive me. Today I receive you, I accept you, and make you Lord of my life. Inviting you into my heart and inviting you into my mind. And I follow you today more than ever before. Today, I receive your grace. Today, I receive your forgiveness. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Don't underestimate the small symbols or small things. If you said that prayer or you said it online, wherever you're watching from, church family, can we give them by a round of applause a welcome to the family of God? Now listen, for some of us, for some of us watching online, you need to just get in a car and come to church so you can be water baptized. Can I get an amen right there? Because in the Bible, that's what they did. They gave their heart to God and then they were immediately baptized. For some of us, we've already made that decision, but for some of us, we're making the decision right now. I don't know where you are in your walk of faith, but I do know what is a symbol of those who believe and follow. And your next step might be water baptism. You need to see somebody in the, in the foyer in a red shirt. We got blow dryers, change of clothes. We got mousse. We got hairspray. We got it all. If that's you, Follow Jesus' example in being water baptized. If you said that prayer, I want you to text the word choose to 97,000. Not going to be put on any list, but when I first said that prayer, I didn't know what to do next. We just created some easy steps for you because it's a different life. Amen. It's a different life. Amen. It's a different life. Amen. Church, let's stand to our feet. Let's stand to our feet and continue to worship together. I worship you, yeah. I worship you. 
made, miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. But we sing even when, see, even when I don't see it, you're working, even when I don't feel it, you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. There's a place for 
with us. As you leave, our prayer team will be up front. Go and be blessed. We'll see you next weekend, church. Thank you for joining us for service today. We love that we get to serve you and your family. If you would like to continue your worship experience through giving, we have three simple, quick, and secure ways for you to do so. First, you can use text to give Simply compose a text message with the keyword thechapel.cc, followed by your gift amount to 77977. Hit send and follow the prompts. Or visit our website, thechapel.cc slash give and complete your giving online. Finally, you can always mail in your giving to the chapel at 1324 Seven Springs Boulevard, suite number 363, Newport Ritchie, Florida, 34655. Thank you for your continued generosity. We could not and would not want to do this without you.